So our uh, next speaker is Tari T. Uh, Ranjarad, and uh, he works in the area of neutrino physics. And actually, in this room, to, in a faculty meeting about a promotion, I was trying to explain to the assembled fac faculty why neutrino physics is hard. And what I came up with is neutrinos don't interact much, so there aren't many interactions. So you just can't afford to waste them the way a guy at a collider can just waste hundreds of thousands of events and, and just choose the ones that really uh, are easy to find. So uh, Taratree works on uh, neutrinos at the Microboon experiment and his, his thing is trying to get absolutely everything he can out of the data from the experiment. Okay. Great. Thank you uh, for the introduction. Uh, yeah, so today I'm really excited to be able to share with you uh, some uh, the, the progress on some uh, analysis effort that we just started a few months ago. And even though this uh, project is uh, still at its very early stages, um, we think that it's, shown, it's been shown to have a, a bunch of promise. And so I want to share what we're trying to do, and that is to go from pixels uh, of an image like this to neutrinos in, in the microbrune experiment. So the subject of my uh, talk and my uh, area of interest is in the neutrino which is, as we know, uh, one of the fundamental particles that make up our universe. So there's several things we know about the neutrino. The first of which is it comes in three types or flavors. There's the electron neutrino, the muon neutrino, and the tau neutrino. And um, this, the other thing that we know is that they interact uh, with the other particles uh, only with the weak force and with gravity. And the consequence of this is that neutrino is j just rarely interact with anything at all. And that provides a lot of challenges, which will come up uh, later on this uh, talk. Um, but so those are some of the things that we do know. But there are many, many uh, things that we uh, don't understand. Um, and that's what makes uh, studying the neutrino a very exciting and uh, rich field of, of study. So recently, we learned that the neutrino has mass. And even though we know that it's, it's a, a, a very small mass, we don't know its exact value nor do we understand the, the, the uh, mechanism by which it gets its mass. Uh, we also want to know if the neutrino and the antineutrinos behave in the same way. And over the uh, past several decades, there have been a number of experiments that have shown some anomalies um, that could be interpreted as hints that there may be more than just these three neutrinos um, that exist. So last year, I was up here. Um, and you may recall, I talked about this prototype detector called DUDOT that I work on with, uh, with uh, Professor uh, Winslow. And the goal of this detector was to try and answer this question, how do neutrinos get their mass? Uh, but this year, I uh, decided to change it up a little bit and talk about the other experiment I work on, Microboon. And this is inside uh, the cryostat of, uh, of Microboon. And the goal of Microboon is to answer this question, are there more than three neutrinos? And so the way that Microboon and other experiments that are uh, after the same uh, goal uh, do this is through the very precise measurements of a process known as neutrino oscillations. So oscillations is a process where one neutrino created as one type can be detected as another. And so uh, a neutrino, for example, that's created as a muon neutrino uh, can travel some distance where you can try to detect it and it'll have some non-zero chance of being uh, a, a different neutrino at that point. Uh, for example, an electron neutrino. So in this cartoon, uh, so in practice, we, we can't do what this cartoon uh, suggests, is where we shoot an individual neutrino at a detector um, and, and see uh, what probability it has to be detected as another state. Uh, such an experiment would take a very, very long time. Uh, and so instead, what we do is we get a very intense source of neutrinos. For example, we'll, we'll make a, a beam of them. And we'll make uh, a beam with some known uh, uh, type composition or flavor composition. So for example, here in this cartoon, we start off with a beam that's all uh, muon neutrinos. We'll let this beam travel some distance to our detector, at which point the detector's job is to uh, sample this uh, flux and determine um, what's the flavor composition at this distance. So over the last uh, couple decades, uh, we've done a lot of work to uh, measure the model of, of oscillations. So we have a very, uh, the parameters of the model of oscillations. And we can make uh, fairly precise predictions about what we should expect here given uh, three neutrinos um, and some other parameters. But um, if we uh, set up an experiment and see something uh, anomalous, then that's a sign that there is new physics out there, which might include the existence of uh, additional neutrinos that we haven't taken into account. So that's what we're trying to do. We're trying to measure oscillations with a beam. And so for Microboom, we get our intense neutrino source uh, at Fermilab, which is a, an accelerator uh, about an hour outside of Chicago. 
This is an aerial view of the site and the accelerator. And the beam that we use is referred to as the booster neutrino beam. It's a, a beam of uh, mostly muon neutrinos. And about uh, 450 meters from the start of this beam is uh, microboon, here shown in, uh, by the black dot. And so microboon is looking for the, uh, to see if any of the muon neutrinos from this beam oscillate into electron neutrinos. So again, the way we do this is um, to measure the flavor composition of the beam at, at microboon. But again, the neutrino interacts only via the weak force. It has no uh, charge, which means that uh, a detector can't see it directly. Uh, you have to have a, a charge for a detector to be able to see it. So instead, we have to rely on looking at the uh, products from neutrino interactions with our detector. So here's some examples of interactions that we might look for. So for a muon neutrino, it'll interact with a neutron that's found in the, uh, the nucleus uh, of the material of our detector. And it'll produce a muon and a proton, with our both, which are both charged and we can see. Um, for an electron neutrino, we'll look for uh, this kind of interaction, where again, the neutrino interacts with a neutron and produces an electron and proton, both charged, and we can see them. Um, and you can tell if, if there's a way for us to identify um, a muon from an electron, then we, then we have a way to be able to count uh, how many uh, muon neutrinos pass through an inherited detector and how many electron neutrinos pass through our detector. So this is what we're after, trying to pick out these muons and these electrons and also to look at these protons. And on microboon, we have a, very, uh, well, uh, a, a detector that's very good at this. So it's a, a type of detector uh, uh, called a liquid argon time projection chamber, or LARTPC. And the great thing about these detectors is that it produces these very uh, beautiful photographic quality images of the interactions that we're interested in. So here is some simulated data of, of these interactions. So on the left is uh, uh, one of the ones I showed on the previous slide, where a muon neutrino interacts and produces a muon and a proton. And you can see what the, uh, the, these muon and the protons look like in our detector. Um, likewise, for the electron and neutrino, uh, we produce an uh, electron and proton, and this is what it looks like in the detector. So we can see we get this little short track for the proton in both cases, but for uh, the, the muon neutrino, which produces a muon, you get this long track, and for the electron neutrino, you get this, um, these tracks with a lot of branch-like structure, which we refer to as a, an electromagnetic, sho electromagnetic shower. And you can just tell by eye that using these images, we can tell the difference between muon and electrons, identify them, therefore count uh, the uh, Number, the, the number and type of neutrinos that have, are, are hitting our detector. So those are simulated images, and, but here is a, a real images from uh, a, a real image from our data, and this is a, um, a neutrino interaction in microboon. So again, we get these very nice uh, images, and, and so what is it showing? It's showing the location where a charged particle deposited charge and energy into the detector. So in these darker regions, uh, no charge was observed. But in these lighter blue regions, um, a, a, minimum, a, par, a charged particle produced a minimum amount of ionization at that location. While in the red regions, that, that color is indicating that there was a lot of charge deposited at that spot. Um, and, and sort of in between case, we get uh, the green color. And so what we're trying to do with these images is, is to parse them and identify the particles that were produced in a neutrino interaction. So well, when you see this sort of minimum ionizing track, uh, that's long, we can be fairly sure that it's from due to a muon. If it's a short track with a lot of ionization, uh, it's more likely due to a proton. And then these middle cases sometimes can uh, be due to a particle known as a, a charged pion. And so and this is what the, what the goal is. And by uh, taking these tracks, we can then, of course, infer the neutrino, uh, information about the neutrino that uh, created this interaction. So in this case, because a muon showed up, we can be fairly sure that the neutrino that interacted, or we can be very sure that it's a muon neutrino. So I've, I've shown you, so this is a very, uh, well, in addition to these tracks, right, that come from the neutrino interaction, you also see these lines as well, and these long sort of uh, minimum ionizing lines, and these are also from muons, but these are not from neutrinos, but instead uh, are, are from muons that come from cosmic rays produced uh, in, uh, in the atmosphere. Um, and, and there's an example of the, uh, of the challenges that we face uh, to reconstruct these images. Um, because the one I picked out here is, is fairly simple, right? Um, but it, it, it can be much harder. For example, what I showed you was a zoom in of, of a, a neutrino that we had identified. But in, in actuality, what we have in, is a, a huge uh, image um, where there's a bunch of these cosmic ray muons going around. So what we have to do is we have to uh, find that neutrino in the image. Of course, because the neutrino interacts so very rarely uh, with, with matter, 
we have to take a lot of images uh, in order to be able to find one that actually has a neutrino. Um, so many of the times we'll be analyzing images where a neutrino isn't uh, there, and so we have to be able to tell well, when um, there is one. And so that means that we have to assemble a lot, a lot of images to find um, as many neutrinos as we can and um, make sure that we get every single one of them. And, and so this, there's just so many images that'll be just uh, too many to do by hand. And so we have to develop uh, computer algorithms uh, um, to do this task for us. And so this led us to start an effort uh, a few months ago and apply this uh, sort of state-of-the-art image uh, analysis technique called convolutional uh, neural nets, or uh, CNNs. And it's very, very good at parsing images. It has a number of advantages, um, uh, two of which is that it's uh, very scalable to different size images. And I think one of the main features that it's really taken off uh, recently is that it's a very generalizable technique. It's been able to be, the same technique has been applied successfully to many, many different types of problems. And I have a few examples up here. So you can ask this uh, image processing technique to find uh, things in your image, for example, faces. Um, uh, the, the technique can also be used to analyze video that will help a car uh, drive itself. And um, some of you may have also heard that recently a computer was able to be a human um, at this game called Go. Now this was very significant because it was a huge milestone in the development of artificial intelligence. Um, uh, experts in the field believe that this wasn't, gonna, wasn't achievable for another decade or more. Um, but one of the core parts of the algorithm that, uh, for this computer to play Go involves these convolutional neural nets. So it's uh, quite powerful and, and can do many things. So what does it do? So just uh, li like uh, many other image analysis techniques, what you do is you take an image and try to decompose it to simpler parts that a computer can understand uh, more easily. So if, you know, for us, we can easily recognize this as a picture of a cat. But for the computer, what you'll want to do is break it up into uh, objects, like uh, the nose and the, the eyes, and then break those down even further to these very, very rudimentary patterns, which are sort of uh, patterns of different light dark edges or different uh, colors that the computer can uh, locate. But once you locate them and break it down, then you have to put them back together in order to uh, find an object that you're interested in. And so the way the CNNs do it is it uses this operation called the convolutional filter, uh, which in essence identifies the location of patterns in an image. So for example, if, you, if you're looking for a specific set of patterns, here is the light, light dark edges at different orientations. You'll apply this uh, oper operation on your input image, for example, this one here, and what you get back is another image that shows you where this pattern showed up. Um, and that's indicated by the light and the dark regions. Um, so you'll get the, where, the location where the pattern and its inverse um, was located. And you can do this for many different types of patterns, and then you assemble a bunch of images. And so now what you get is you get the location of different patterns at a specific spot. So at that point, what you can do is then start to aggregate uh, uh, patterns that are at a specific position, that are by each other, and you keep aggregating patterns and patterns of patterns until you can find an object. So just uh, as a more concrete example, um, take uh, facial recognition. So you start off with your picture and you look for these low-level objects, but then you apply this convolutional feature, uh, uh, operation again, this time not in, in the uh, image uh, space, but rather in the abstract space of patterns, so you look for um, sort of local uh, correlations between patterns. And these then represent your sort of uh, uh, higher level objects. So for in the case of facial recognition, um, uh, eyes and noses and things like this. And then you keep doing this over and over and over again and assemble more complex uh, patterns until you can finally get to the point where a computer can recognize that there's a face at some uh, place in the image. But, you know, what really separates CNNs from other image analysis techniques, which more or less do the same thing, is that uh, you don't have to do much thinking. Um, you know, as you uh, uh, try to look for different things, you have to come up with these patterns um, in order to try to find your object. But instead, these CNNs uh, find these pattern, learn these patterns by themselves. And this is the, the key thing that has allowed uh, this technique to take off and do so many different things. And so one of the things that we want it to do is to look for neutrinos. So there already exists, uh, luckily for us, several um, CNN algorithms that perform tasks that are directly applicable to our, the problem of reconstruction in microboon. So in, in the same way that you're trying to find a face in a crowd in uh, the facial recognition problem, you're trying to find a neutrino in your entire event image. 
So this would be the first step that you have to do. You have to find that the neutrino is there, and then locate it, and then you can find a, a box, put a box around it, and zoom in. After which, you can ask the, the network to classify what type of interaction it is. And ultimately, our goal, which would be really nice, is that th there's this algorithm that can label each pixel in an image as belonging to um, some certain object. So in our case, we have a neutrino interaction, and each individual pixel um, can be labeled as being due to a muon or being due to a proton. And at this point, you, know, you can imagine we can get to information about the neutrino itself. So remember, we're, we, try, we, find, uh, we infer what type of neutrino is based on uh, these interaction products. And so because it's a muon, you would know that this is due to a, a muon uh, neutrino. OK. So this, you know, once we learned about this technique and thought about how to use it, we were really excited um, uh, to try it out. But the one thing we were worried about is that these CNNs have been typically um, applied to natural images. And, and natural images are very information dense. There's a lot of things going on. There's a lot of color and things like this. So the question was, can it um, work with uh, simple images as well, um, which uh, is in our case, where we're dealing with mostly lines and, and, and these uh, basic patterns. And so what we did is we did some studies uh, with, using uh, uh, artificial data that we generated with our simulations. And that was uh, images of, of different types of particles. For example, four particles here. And these are important for the analyses that we want to do at Microboon. Um, so you already know about the electron, muon, and proton that we want to find. And this is how we identify uh, uh, neutrinos. But we're also interested in uh, being able to pick out a particle uh, called a neutral pion, which decays into two photons uh, most of the time. And, when it, and two photons in the detector look like uh, two uh, showers. So the reason that this is a background is because you can imagine for some reason one of these showers disappears, it leaves the detector or is too low energy, what, then what you get is a single shower which looks very much like an electron. So we want to tell if, if it could distinguish these uh, uh, fairly well. And so we did some first studies and uh, we got um, some pretty promising results. So this is the performance of the network when it looks at an a, a, a electron image. And uh, most of the time, 82% of the time, it correctly identifies it as an electron. Um, and we know we can do much better. Um, this is just sort of a first uh, start. And there are some choices that we made that probably uh, hurt this. And so we expect this number to go up. Uh, but importantly, the way it makes mistakes is that it, it uh, identifies electrons incorrectly as pi zeros. And that makes sense. Those are the, that's the type of mistake we would expect to happen. So that was nice to see. So we did a number of studies, and they all uh, were very encouraging. So then we began to take the first step towards uh, neutrino identification using CNNs. So remember, the first step we want to do is to find uh, the neutrino in our event image. So we set up a network, we trained it, and we had it run on a small uh, test sample. And we saw that, in fact, that it is able to find neutrino interactions. So it's a, uh, very, we're you know, still in the very early stages. So we need to do a lot of work to understand how well it's doing. Uh, that we're not fooling ourselves, but uh, you know, we're encouraged by the fact that Monte Carlo studies have shown that we should be able to do this with efficiencies upward of 95% or higher. Um, so anyway, um, this is an example event. This is the full event image, and I've uh, zoomed in on what we believe to be the neutrino, uh, what the network believes is the neutrino. Um, and, and so you can see here a short, a highly ionizing track, which is uh, probably from a proton, and then a longer track, which is probably from a muon. This is a sign of a muon neutrino. So the, uh, this. Uh, Type of neutrino has been detected by our network. So, um, you know, I wish I could show you an electron neutrino, but we, but you know, we expect this oscillation to be very rare. So instead, what I what I can show you is uh, an event uh, that a neutrino that the network found that is actually one of our backgrounds. So uh, here um, is the again the full event image, and uh, here is a zoom in. This is the proton track, and then this here is what is likely uh, two gammas coming from uh, this uh, neutral pion which I mentioned before, is the background that we have to identify. So that's nice. OK. So again, we're in the very first stages of this work. But uh, already, we believe that C the CNNs have, uh, are showing a lot of promise um, in being able to analyze their data to, uh, to measure oscillations at microboon. Um, and so you know, this technique uh, we, yeah, is uh, very promising, and it's been actually a lot of fun to work on. So we're looking at other things we can do as well. So we're collaborating with a fellow Papalardo fellow, uh, Orhen, who you just uh, heard from a little bit ago, and also a former fellow, Josh Spitz, who's now a professor at uh, University of Michigan, 
to look for rare decays uh, of lithium-8. Um, I'm also looking to try to apply this technique to the work that I was doing, I uh, am doing with uh, Professor Winslow uh, on NuDOT, and we're thinking that these CNNs can help separate signal from background uh, very uh, effectively. So finally, I just want to acknowledge the team. So here at MIT, it's myself and uh, Professor Conrad and a, a graduate student, uh, Gabriel Collin. We also work with uh, folks at Columbia. Uh, so here's uh, Kazu, who was a former MIT student here. And then uh, his PhD student, Vic. <laughs> You'll have to ask Kazu. <laughs> yeah. And then also, of course, uh, you know, I would also a big thanks uh, to acknowledgement to Microboon and all those who work on the experiment and, and help provide the data, including myself. And so, and then finally, a big uh, thank you to Neil and Jane for the opportunity this fellowship provides. This picture here is, uh, it's actually not produced by network, unfortunately, but uh, it's made out of the muons that travel through a detector. It's put together by one of the graduate students in uh, Janet's group. And also, I just want to point out that the fellowship comes with some independent funding, and it was very helpful in getting this project um, off and running from the beginning. So in order to do this technique, you have to buy some fairly specialized uh, computing equipment. And so, but with these funds, we were able to start from reading papers, getting really excited, to um, training networks in a little less than two weeks. So that's really great. So again, uh, thank you uh, for that opportunity. And thanks everyone for their attention. I sort of wonder, when I see these plots, um, in this case, presumably particles you assumed before, and muon particles. Mm -hmm. Obviously, we don't see necessarily plots of, of neutrinos themselves. They interact so slowly. But even taking muons for a second, mm -hmm. is it obvious that the lines we see that appear to be always connected are were detected as a series of locate dots, if you were, and then artificially converted to a line? In other words, I, I don't have any feeling for the ability to detect a particle which moves in a linear fashion, although they're always drawn that way. As a line? Okay. Yeah, so, so um, yeah, I, I believe so. So um, these images show charge depositions uh, for our, for our neighboring locations, and very close locations, too. So this goes into the way that liquid argon uh, ch chambers work, and so I have some slides on that so I can, I can show you. Um, so what happens is that a neutrino comes in and a charged particle travels in a line, right? Um, and then it produces some ionization. And because there's an electric field uh, um, in, it's, uh, put in the detector, this charge uh, gets drifted to a set of wires um, where they uh, show up. And so, you know, when, so when we see a neighboring pixel uh, show signal, that means there was a neighboring wire that showed the signal. And, um, and, and so I definition draw a straight line between those two? Well, lines? it's the task of uh, the anal analyzers to draw the line and to draw it correctly. Um, but, but visually, uh, I mean, you can see that, that it, it's likely due to a particle right, that's well, uh, traveling. My only issue is it seems to me particles sometimes have I guess I would say all times have certain wave properties. Mm. And waves don't necessarily appear as a straight yeah. line. And I wonder, does that ever interfere with your bill or is your assumption? Yeah. So, see so the interactions that happen in the detector, I think, are, are, can be modeled fairly well as classical processes. So we don't have to worry about such effects like this. Um, you know, we're dealing with. Uh, Length scales, and I mean this is a very, very high resolution detector, but it's still three millimeters. So, at that distance, for, for this case, I don't think we have to worry about uh, such effects. I have two maybe related questions. Mm -hmm. What happened to the tau neutrinos, <laughs> and how does this help you find out uh, if sure. there's a fourth kind of neutrino or a fifth kind of neutrino, which is the original question mm -hmm. you posed? Yeah. So. So the, for the tau neutrino, um, we don't, typically our experiments don't uh, worry about that because, uh, well, we don't use them so often because you ha the neutrinos have to have enough energy uh, to produce that, uh, the, the, the tau. And oftentimes with these beams, they're, they're at an energy where um, they, we don't make a lot of them. Then that's the case for microboon. 
Um, but you can use them, and if you have a beam that is energetic enough, uh, you can use them to uh, measure as part of the flux composition, and it's uh, very useful to, to measure these things, or measure oscillations. So you, you asked the question of how exactly um, is sort of counting all the different species uh, related to the number of neutrinos. And that has to do with the fact that um, the number of uh, species uh, dictates um, the details of the oscillation, the probability of neutrino oscillating from one to another. So um, it's, it's a quantum mechanical process where the, the new, different neutrinos, they're created in one state, but when they move through space, um, they actually propagate in their mass states, which are actually different from the neutrino. So it's this weird uh, quantum mechanical effect. And, but, and because all these states are interfering, um, you know, you get this thing where even though you're really looking at sort of two types of neutrinos, the muon, electron, um, uh, the muon neutrino and the electron neutrino, because there's this quantum effect, it actually uh, requires, you know, to be able to model it correctly, you have to consider all the possible states of the neutrinos. And this is, allows you to have access to, the, to, uh, um, to whether or not there are more than just the three neutrinos out there. So if there are more states than when you do the quantum mechanics, you have to include them. And that's going to give you a different prediction for the amount of oscillations that occur. So the counts are going to specific. Mm -hmm. So in the end, even though you're just looking for uh, two flavors, yeah, the specific number of electron neutrinos that appear will be uh, related to the number of states uh, of, of states that the neutrino has. So, so I have a question. Can you go to the page with pa facial recognition? Sure. Yeah, the back, back. No, there, there was one where you had all the little patches. Uh, this yeah. one? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Okay, so this answer, is, so I want you to, uh, I have a very expensive Nikon camera <laughs> that does facial recognition. Mm -hmm. And my wife's face, my face, my daughter's face, my neighbor's face, and he's quite ugly, you know, it, it finds the face. Mm -hmm. It won't find my cat's face. Yeah. And that's because of the elements that are in layer three. Is, is that the right way to think of it? That yeah. they didn't put yeah. cat elements? Yeah, it, it's, it's looking for specific elements, but uh, these networks are very, very uh, powerful, and they can look for very, very specific things and, and, uh, and, you know, and ignore the, the, the ones that don't help as well, <laughs> your cat. For example, <laughs> I feel much better. <laughs> so, so the great thing, right? So normally, when we, when the classical way of doing reconstruction is, we think of our patterns to look for, and then we use those to to make up to look for the neutrino. The great thing about this technique is that I don't actually have to think of any patterns. The network itself learns the patterns it needs to to accomplish the task that I assign it, and you know, which is uh, which is really great. It's, Um, so, yeah, I think that's a, a real risk, and that's something that uh, we'll, we'll try uh, to understand. So the reason that we think that we, we can proceed is due to um, our initial simulated data studies, and it, they performed uh, quite well. Um, but of course, the concern with, with these kind of techniques is that, well, if your data that you're trying, using to represent the data is your, fake, your artificial data doesn't represent the real data, then you have problems, right? And, um, and so there's a number of things that we've done to, to try and mitigate that, and there's a number of things that uh, we will do. So for one, um, these networks are very good at associating one type of thing to another. You can think of it as a very arbitrary function, right, that can do this. And so, the, um, and so you have to be careful about what you're asking these networks to do. And so what we're, we, what, you know, in principle, I could ask the network to take these images and then associate it to some neutrino uh, histogram that would actually give us the oscillation answer right away. Um, but instead, what we've asked it to do is to be able to help us find these final state particles in, in the detector, right? So these things, um, we feel like we'll have other tools to be able to look for them. We also know things um, that should happen. For example, the rate at which a muon, for instance, uh, decays, or how many of such muons should show up in the detector. 
So we have uh, uh, different metrics um, in the data that we can use to check that our networks are behaving properly and in the way that we expect. In addition to that, by choosing to ask the network to really only find these things in, in the image, um, there are things that you can do to guard against uh, errors. And you know, the, one of the nice things about these CNNs is that uh, it's a very, very uh, hot topic and uh, different uh, universities and companies are doing a lot of analysis. And recently there was a paper that showed how you can stabilize uh, these networks against uh, perturbations to your image. And you can do that by how you set up the problem for this network to solve. And we can do something similar to guard against errors in our simulation. So in the end, we're producing these images, all right, which, which, uh, which relies on a model of our detector. And so if you make errors in, those, uh, in the model of the detector, they'll show up at, as maybe deviations of where these lines are or, or uh, uh, blurs and things like this. And that can be directly mapped to some basic image uh, processing techniques. And we can then use these newly developed methods um, to guard against uh, errors and stabilize the network's performance against, the, against these type of image, uh, image errors. And so you know, I think in the end, I have to say that you know, we don't know if it's, uh, if it's truly going to work. But we really think um, uh, that there's a lot of promise. And we've put some thought into how we can guard against uh, some of these pitfalls that we might run into in the future. OK, let's thank Tara Tree again. Mm -hmm.